true to our culture, I'm incredibly proud that in less than two years, our team has achieved more revenue in this one quarter than the full year revenue of FY 2020 reported post our IPO. In the last nine months, we surpassed the previous full year's cash flow from operations by 35%. Our CPCU business noted a strong momentum, delivering 58.5 million user conversions during the quarter, an increase of 91.2% year on year at an INR 51.8 CPCU rate. The last two years were strategically crucial for us as we completed our Apple 2.0 strategic foundation anchored on the two Bs, vernacular and verticalization, and two Os, OEMs and operator partnerships. And we fortified our consumer platform tech stack and we invested towards our market and team expansion globally. In this period, the global tech ecosystem experienced extensive shifts. New privacy norms unfolded, pandemic struck the economies worldwide, while the consumer adoption of digital and connected devices increased multifold. Our business continues to be resilient and is in high growth momentum towards our vision of reaching over 10 billion connected devices in this decade ahead. This quarter also witnessed a robust, broad-based uptake in advertiser spend towards mobile marketing, well supported by the festive season two, and coming across the top industry verticals in India and international markets. Powered by our ROI-linked CPCU business model and unique position in the industry, we continue to grow as a preferred mobile marketing company across global, global emerging markets and beyond. Historically, our India and international contribution, balanced at about 50-50 each, shifted last quarter in favor of international on account of our successful integration of JAM and our efforts to build local on-ground presence in newer international markets. The contribution stood at about 69% international and 31% India in this quarter. I would like to thank all the analysts and investors for attending our first Investors Day held in December 2021, where we unveiled our Apple 2.0 consumer tech platform stack. Our top eight leaders presented nine sessions with live demos of our tech platform and case studies with 11 customer testimonials that provided clarity on how our Apple 2.0 culture, our strategy, our tech IP and execution focus are all deeply aligned to leverage upon the tremendous digital shift ongoing globally. Our tech IP enabled consumer platform innovations in particular, and all our organic as well as inorganic investments in general are performing well, and we continue to establish new thought leadership benchmarks in our industry globally. We had a remarkable start in 2022, with our tech stack recognized as the best technology platform for advertising, and we won several of the top awards at the prestigious India Digital Awards organized by IAMAI. Apple also won the Technology Company of the Year and 16 other top awards at the fifth edition of Mobex Awards organized by Adgali. These wins came across top and most relevant categories, including most outstanding programmatic platform, excellence in cross-screen campaigns, best use of chatbots, in-store commerce, and more. To ensure deeper understanding and appreciation of our consumer platform use cases, we continue to also include case studies in our earnings presentation for past few quarters, showcasing the power of our platform to deliver consumer conversions and drive value for our customers across key verticals and markets. We are a value-driven organization, and we strive to ensure that our performance is driven by utmost integrity and transparency. In view of the same, uh, the board has decided to appoint Mr. Vijaynath, who is the non-executive independent director of the company, as the non-executive chairman of our board to be effective from April 1st, 2020. I will, of course, continue to lead the company as the chief executive officer. In spirit, we were already prepared to do so in 2020. However, given that we had just gone public listed at that time, hence we did not want to undertake any major changes in the leadership structure of the company in 2020. I believe now is the right time to set forth this change for holistic organizations. And I now hand the session to our CFO, Mr. Dani, to discuss the financial. And thank you. Over to you, Kapil. Thank you, Manoj. Trust all of you are keeping safe and in good health. 
Continuing our growth momentum in Q3, the company reported a revenue from operations of rupees 3394 million, a growth of 125.5% year on year. Sequentially, our revenue has increased by 23.6%, driven by team efforts and healthy festival spending by the advertisers. Our EBITDA for this quarter stood at rupees. 677 million, an increase of 76.4% year on year and 29.9 quarter on quarter. If we compare our OPEX on a sequential basis with previous quarter, inventory and data cost has increased by 22.7%, almost in line with growth, uh, revenue growth. Employee, uh, sorry, employee expenses have increased by 18.1% on account of appraisal cycle affected from the month of October. We continue to invest to enhance our team to deepen across, uh, to deepen our access across Indian international market and uh, including the cost of ESOS, which for the current quarter is INR 13.58 million. And the total ESOS expense for the current grant is valued at 219.53 million for a period of four years. Our reported profit after tax for the quarter stood at 621 million, a year on year increase of 102.6% and a sequential growth of 30.4%. Our normalized profit after tax after adjusting gains on fair valuation of our financial instruments was rupees uh, 601 million an increase of 96% year-on-year and 42.9% quarter-on-quarter. We remain focused on working capital management and continue to see robust cash flows from operations. Our collections were robust and ratio of cash flow from our operations to profit after tax stood at 106.4%. This shows quality of our customers, robustness of our operations. EPS has been adjusted for stock split for the current quarter as well as comparable period. As a post-quarter event subsequent to our share purchase agreement dated June 8, 2020, Apple International Limited, a wholly owned subsidiary of Apple India, acquired 66.67% uh, shares of AppNext. We decided to acquire 28.33% of AppNext post balance sheet event. The liability to acquire these shares were already recognized in our accounts and accounting of the financials were already being done on an anticipated acquisition method. In June 2020, hence the minority interest in our books since June 2020 continues to be at 5% for AFMEX business. I draw your attention to note 6A of the consolidated financial results for the same. With this, I end our presentation. Let us please open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on the touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, please press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Anmol Kark from Dam Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi Anujan Kapil. Congratulations on a very strong performance during the quarter. So I had a couple of questions. Firstly, I uh, wanted to understand that uh, this time, our, while our India business revenue has increased quite a bit, however, we have saw some drop in the PBT uh, during the quarter. Uh, what could be the reason uh, for the same? That's my first question. And uh, secondly, wanted to understand what will be the jump contribution during the quarter? And uh, also, if the jam, how much of the jam business is shifted to CPCU model, given that the non-CPCU growth rate uh, during the quarter was uh, higher than CPCU growth rate? So to answer that, uh, okay. the, the, do you want to take it or should I take it? So uh, the the margins for the India business is almost the same as the Q2 uh, for the uh, current year, if you see it. 
However, if you see on Y and Y, uh, the, uh, the, there can be a slight uh, differences because of the, uh, the data inventory cost when you do in the, uh, uh, the, the festive season. There are a lot of demand and supply in questions. But if you see on a quarter to quarter basis, our uh, margins are stable. The, the TBT can, uh, can be attributed to two reasons, is increase in the cost of the uh, human resource uh, investments. On, uh, can we repeat the second question, Kha? Yeah, sure. Because we can take the second question. So, in terms of the jam contribution, uh, in this quarter, jam's contribution on revenue was approximately a third. And uh, in terms of EBITDA performance, we were able to bring jam up to the 7 to 8 percent EBITDA in this quarter, which is, which is um, as per the playbook and the uh, uh, expectation that we have said that we will, within the first year of the acquisition, bring it to single high digit EBITDA performance, and we have achieved that in this quarter. Of course, it's helped a little bit by the festive season and the volumes, but um, you know, over time, we believe in the first year of the acquisition, we should be able to you know, keep this momentum moving in a favorable way. And so, so the jam contribution, you, you're right, I think it's contributing some part of the revenue on the CPCU side already, and some part is still in the non-CPCU, but it's a healthy mix as the transition is progressed. Just, just as a reminder, we, we signed the term sheet to acquire JAM uh, only early this year, and we completed the acquisition only on 1st of July. So this is six months have gone since we actually completed it, and about nine months since we uh, really kind of uh, ink, uh, put ink on the table to, to commit towards this transaction. So it's, it's a work in progress. And as we continue to grow and transform it over the next subsequent years, we hope to achieve, um, you know, materially higher EBITDA performance on Jam, and there should therefore be margin upside over time on that business for us. Sure. Thank you, Anuj. I'll get back in the queue. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Arun Prashad from Spark Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, opportunity. Uh, Anuj, uh, my question is on, on the Visuri. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we acquired uh, Visuri uh, mainly for the retargeting purpose. Uh, now the rules of the retargeting game itself is uh, being heavily distracted because of the privacy-related concerns. We know that Facebook is uh, very heavy on retargeting and they are uh, they have given very tepid outlook and, uh, and we know the performance in the last nine months. So, so I, I understand Axel is more to its uh, campaigns, but uh, if you can if you can uh, visualize and if you can just explain to us what kind of uh, disruptions that you are anticipating in the UEA campaigns, and 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 how how Axel is uh, uh, ready or or, or or ready to take over or meet the challenges. That is uh, my first question. All right. Well, thank you for your insightful question. First of all, uh, the jury and uh, Engage 360 product uh, within the jury is doing exceptionally well for us, and we're extremely happy with the way we are doing going about it. And the the way we work on on the jury uh, product specifically is deeper integrations with the advertisers and reliant on first party data. That pretty much eliminates any confusion related. Uh, to data privacy or concerns because our technology sits deeply inside and integrated with the advertiser working, you know, as part of their one platform and system, leveraging their data to engage with the consumer. So in our, in our part, like we call it the first party data, and we're doing exceptionally well there. And there is absolutely no concern that we have at the moment with respect to, you know, privacy or data privacy and, um, and issues pertaining to that. Also, because, uh, you know, visually and uh, our retargeting business is a much smaller part of our overall business. And there is a massive room for consistent growth. If you look at one of the case studies that we have attached in our earnings presentation, and this is the last one that's already uh, attached there, it is uh, showcasing how we have actually managed to do or bring uh, massive success uh, for one of our customers in the context of iOS and IDFA related changes. Now, most of us would think that, oh, uh, iOS changes, IDFA changes means that 
advertising on iOS will be less effective and so on. If you look at the results of that particular campaign, of course, it's not representative of every campaign, but it shows that we could do 41% higher ROI in scan campaigns, which is on iOS 14, versus Android campaigns for the same product in the same period. Now, of course, it's not comparable exactly because the users are different, but I mean, hey, I mean, it's a very important benchmark that, look, we are able, our tech stack can actually deliver outcomes on iOS as well. And we've seen that not only uh, for new user acquisition campaigns, but also in some limited sense on uh, being able to do some retargeting where the advertising first party data is available. So that's one sort of quick answer to you on that. But overall, what we're seeing as a trend is that our company is perfect and our capabilities. Uh, in the last two years, we have laid a solid foundation to address uh, whether it's data privacy issues or whether it's iOS um, voting related issues. And, and we are looking at this very holistically for the decade ahead and building a platform that will deliver on the momentum of consistent, sustainable growth. So, and across our platforms, as I mentioned in my commentary, we are doing well all our investments and the pieces of those investments. And we are very privileged that every single one of them that we've done is actually performing well. Confidence, therefore, as you would have seen, that increasingly our investment size or size of transaction has gone up. I mean, Jam uh, just six months or ago was our largest transaction. And the reason for that bigger transaction is because we are very convinced that our playbook is working, and we did the smaller transactions, whether it was you know last several years ago with Jury or the more recent ones, Media Smart Appnex and now Jam. And you know our confidence is you know very high, and our, you know we've become much better at doing this, and and this is clearly working well for us. Thank you. Uh, and the second part of the questions, uh, second part of the first question could be more specific than I said that when I asked that, you know, uh, what sort of disruption that you are anticipating in the UA campaigns in the future and uh, and how, how Apple is ready for those challenges? See, for, uh, I, I did try to address that by showing you that case study and reference to that. If you finally if you don't look into that, and also the analyst day that we had in, uh, sorry, the investors day that we had in December, we had a full topic on that. That in fact, on iOS, uh, we, this is actually one of our fastest uh, growing business units in the company at the moment. And and this is an exciting time. So what, what I indicate to you with that is that we are ready for any changes that may happen even further in the ecosystem, while we have already shown in the last six to nine months of execution that we have negotiated one of the bigger changes and transitions in the ecosystem on iOS quite well, both for user acquisition, new user conversions, as well as for repeat user conversions. So, so, so I, I think that that's quite a specific answer, I thought. I mean, what else would you like to know? Okay, uh, all right. Uh, just, uh, you, you said that Apple today has uh, that the overall scheme of the things retargeting is a very small part. Can you just uh, give a ballpark, quantify that? Uh, is, it, uh, uh, is, it, is it like 10%, 20%? Some ballpark number would be interesting. Um, see, I, I, I'm not at liberty to reveal that because of uh, the fact that there's comparatively sensitive information. But what I can tell you is that when we work with our advertisers, for example, an advertiser, A, we look at the entire consumer's life cycle, right? So, so not just getting the first conversion with the consumer, but also getting repeat online conversions from that consumer for the same advertiser, as well as looking for online to offline conversion of that particular user with that same advertiser. So we are trying to maximize ROI on that particular consumer. Now, a lion's share of the budget of the advertisers as a trend actually goes towards new user acquisition, especially in emerging markets, because you would imagine all the advertisers thinking uh, they're going to be next 100 million users, we want to get them first. And once the user is in the bag, you know, they they feel that that's like a second priority event to go and uh, maximize the lifetime value. So, so most of the emerging market advertisers or even developed market advertisers in emerging verticals are thinking and putting higher budgets on new user acquisition. So we, I mean, for us, it is, uh, you know, it is comparatively sensitive to reveal this bit because our competition would then know how Apple is, um, you know, uh, proposing and pitching to the customer. And, and that's the reason why our board doesn't, uh, you know, reveal that at, at the moment. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Arun. May I request to please rejoin the queue? We have participants waiting for the turn. Sure. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Jain from Dalat Capital. Please go ahead. 
Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, congratulations to the team for a very spectacular performance. I have just a couple of questions. Uh, one from a uh, uh, from a TV ad spend data perspective, you see India is the uh, only market which continues to grow on this piece. So, uh, any sense you have in terms of you know when this is going to change and you know would further add up to the momentum that we already uh, have in. Uh, that is question number one. Uh, second is uh, how should we see the jam business uh, to perform in near term? I know your long term view is aligned, but uh, do we see more uh, things to be captured in the jam business given the some of the you know tailwind that you highlighted earlier uh, could play out and it reached to a certain uh, size and then you would see a more normalized growth. So if you could share your thoughts on both of these. Uh, thank you for your question. So the first one on TV ads, and yes, it is uh, quite interesting for, to note that India is, you know, still having such a huge ad spend on TV and also other, uh, uh, you know, channels. But you know, I, I, I'm not going to take um, any expert views on TV advertising. But what I can tell you is that today in digital advertising, as a percentage of total advertising, India stands at about 25 or percent. That means out of every hundred dollars being spent on advertising, only about 25 percent is going towards digital. My view on it is very clear that the writing is on the wall that the advertisers have absolutely no choice but to shift at least 50% of their total budgets on digital. And it's a matter of, I mean, they, they have to do it. I mean, how, the sooner they do it, the better in terms of digital adoption and transformation. And, and, and I think, therefore, there's a massive runway for growth. And where will this, you know, budget come from? I mean, of course, the total ad pie will grow, but digital will go faster at the expense of the TV ad spends are becoming visible. I mean, most of the traditional ad spends, you know, some of them will go in, uh, in favor of uh, becoming digitized and digital. And of course, uh, you know, I think digital is also getting to TV. I mean, the TVs are also becoming smart TVs increasingly. Connected TV propositions that you already know our, our company has already launched products and is, you know, building thought leadership in that space as a first mover in India. I think these are uh, uh, areas that will actually help the advertisers to transition and adopt digital even faster. So, so that's that. Uh, the second question that you have is about Jam in the near term. And I think uh, the way to look at Jam, uh, I think what we've done in the last two courses is already indicated, indicated that we are already upselling, cross-selling, transforming uh, you know, the, the opportunity more holistically with Jam. And we are doing really well on the scan network, the iOS, supposed the IDFA uh, changes. We're doing really well on that basis. The, uh, you know, I think we as a whole group, right? I mean, we've grown quite a bit uh, uh, over the last several years, but we are still having a massive runway for growth, consistent, continued growth, because the market in every job is much larger and the market itself is growing at a 25 or 30% CAGR as an industry across emerging markets. So there's a, you know, a lot of uh, macro uh, economic, you know, tailwind helping us to, you know, continue this momentum. But there's a massive runway for consistent growth before we start feeling that, oh, the growth will normalize or, you know, we'll reach a certain point where it is, you know, uh, uh, flattening. I don't think we are anywhere close to that at the moment. So, so I, I have a lot of expectations in the near term uh, for consistent growth trend, as well as uh, you know, I think I would say near to midterm. Uh, you know, in the next three to five years, we should uh, continue to see a, a fairly impressive growth in the entire industry for our tech. Sure. So you said 30%. Uh, uh, if I missed that number on the ad uh, spend allocation uh, and. Uh, one follow-up is that uh, any uh, specific reason we accelerated on this app next take uh, purchase, I think uh, what I recollect is it was after third year, but it's happened after two years now. And also valuation upside was very nominal. Uh, was this part of the original contract? And lastly, on uh, how the retention thing would be now for uh, Elad and some other key uh, members? Um, a wonderful question. <laughs> No, no, just let me complete. So on the, on the TV ad spend or the digital ad spend, I think the percentage that I was saying was approximately 25% of the total ad spend is going to digital. That was, I mean, of course, you can uh, look at different reports, say different numbers, but this is my assessment of uh, and reading of... No, uh, no, sorry. 
sorry to interrupt but i think i was asking you were saying 25 can actually go to some number i think you said 30 or something i missed that no 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 50% i said minimum 50% percent. Don't go to the and, and wow. the reason where i come up with the number is because in a lot of the markets in the world digital is already over 50% yeah exactly. and exactly. and and by the way digital for india or emerging markets means primarily mobile okay so 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 this is a very very you know, interesting and privileged industry to be in uh, because of the you know solid uh, you know growth momentum and runway ahead. Uh, now, coming to your question on on Appnex, okay? So on Appnex, we have uh, we had a clear contract where we had to you know buy out uh, up to this percentage of the shares uh, by the third year. So what what you will see in our disclosure is that we have done part payment of that now to you know, to, to, to consolidate our ownership to 95% immediately. And there's still a retention link, um, you know, significant part of it. I think, you know, I think those numbers are already disclosed in maybe a couple you can elaborate, where uh, it's actually linked to the founders earning that out at the end of the third year, which is La, Iran, and the team. But the, the non-founding shareholder has already been kind of paid off now, and we've consolidated the entire ownership into our hands and and the reason to do that now is uh, first of all a strong indicator that our acquisition in organic plans have worked out really well especially Hapnex has done fantastically and therefore we are ready to accelerate that and also in fact uh, it leads to better alignment and and, and uh, a much stronger retention of um, entrepreneurial alignment uh, couple you may finally elaborate further so, uh, if you see that our, uh, we have uh, the payment for uh, this 28 percent is the same as being in the liability for the uh, at the time only of the acquisition itself. There is no change in the amount. The amount was pre-decided, and about three million is being paid now. Rest five point uh, some odd millions will be paid after another 18 months. This three million is going out to non-founders uh, payments so that the alignment of the founders can remain 100% with Apple, right? There is no obligation of the founders to the investors of the original AppNext business, and we have the full alignment of the AppNext founders to Apple. So, and, and also our uh, financials were already accounting it at a 95% uh, for consolidation purpose uh, on an anticipated acquisition method. And the liability was already accrued in the balance sheet. So you, what you will see is that a dip of three million in the liability side for, on account of this payment. That's the only change in the financials. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vikas Mastri from Boonshot Ventures. Please go ahead. I have a small question that during the QI said that uh, we will not build a test for the, uh, and we haven't done, well, we have done jam as acquisition, but we have a lot of cash lying with us. What you're trying to do with that? And uh, I, I also know that uh, you are very particular about that acquisition must have some capabilities and all that. So please give us a view that what capabilities we are lacking and in which direction we're thinking to have an acquisition for us. Well, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I think uh, it links back to you know what we did earlier with AppNex. I think we consolidated our position there, and you know, I, I I want to make sure that when we when we do any acquisition, we must we must prove beyond doubt to first of all our own internal management team and to our board and then to our shareholders that what we did in the acquisition was absolutely spot on, responsible, and we have delivered outcomes as per plan. Now. In, if you see the track record of the company, we, we do an acquisition, we, we deliver on that, we make sure that we've done it right, and we go on to the next one and so on and so forth. So yes, there is cash in the bank, but I mean, the cash in the bank is not necessarily a bad thing, but you know, I think what, what's important is that there should be no undue stress that, oh, we must do something just because there's cash in the bank. I think we have to make sure that acquisition is taken very seriously. Our whole process and playbook of long, uh, courtship period, analyzing the companies deeply, meeting them at the not only at the right time when they are at breaking even, but at the right price point for us, and then systematically turning them around to much greater success and alignment. So it has to be carefully calibrated. Now, is there anything really missing in Apple that I'm looking for today, nervously out there to try and fix? The answer is no. I think our foundations with our tech stack, 
Our Apple 2.0 consumer platform stack is a rock solid foundation on which we have already delivered great outcomes and this is a future ready foundation. It's not a foundation that we are, you know, we've built something great of the past and we're just making it. Now we've built something that's future ready. We've launched Connect to TV product, we've launched online to offline connect with the consumer, we've launched household sync and, you know, household ID capabilities in general in the company. Our patents are talking about gestures and, you know, the metaverse world and so on. So, I mean, this is a company that is forward looking and future ready. And our platforms are built and our innovation culture is helping us to keep it consistently in that realm. So I'm not necessarily, you know, uh, out there, you know, actively, you know, chasing something to be closed. But at the same time, we are very, very grounded. So we're watching what's happening in India in all our markets, every other startup, and we've become quite an aspirational team for any entrepreneur to come and align with. So we find you know, a lot of incoming requests coming from entrepreneurs who want to join the Apple entrepreneurial team. And so we are very privileged and we are very careful. And we are watching closely, we are assessing closely, and when the right opportunity comes, we will not be on the back foot, I can assure you, of that we are growth-oriented and aggressively growth-oriented company, and we will take the right steps at the right time. I hope I hope that answers your question. And, if I, uh, and of course, we are also investing in, in the cash to be utilized for Increasing the uh, you know the overall growth of the company, working capital, organic expansion plan. So I think it's it's all in a in a good tandem and balance. I hope that answers your question. Sorry to interrupt. The line of Mr. Vikas have been they have uh, Mr. Vikas have left the queue. We'll move to the next question, which is from the line of Mayank Pabla from Dalal and Barucha. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you for taking my question. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yeah. yeah. Uh, congratulations on a great set of numbers, team. And uh, uh, just a few questions more towards the accounting side. Uh, Kapil, sir, if you could uh, uh, tell me what sits in the difference between the consort and the standalone uh, revenues right now. Uh, because I think approx approximately one third of the uh, revenue is from Jam. So, what is the balance in the console? So the balance in console is our existing uh, without jam international business, which is that which cons constitutes of RedX, Visually, uh, Mass, as well as uh, at Next. Right. Okay. So if you see before Q uh, Q1, uh, the Q1 will have uh, without jam, and uh, there is there was a 50-50 split between India and uh, international, which is now skewed towards uh, international because of the jam. Okay, sure. And so what would be the free cash flow for the quarter? The free cash flow for the quarter would be in the range of about uh, uh, in, the, in the range of about five hundred crores. Okay, okay. And so last question was to Anuj, uh, uh, so in the case study about Baiju's, it was uh, mentioned that uh, you know that you've done uh, optimization for the lower final conversion metrics. So could you expand a little more on that uh, and throw some light? Well, uh, well, I think the, uh, the business that we're in, our focus is always to align the uh, outcomes in terms of conversion to deliver ROI to the advertisers. And and when we work in tier two, tier three, we found uh, cities in India and to onboard new customers. You know, our focus always is to optimize high intent users, right, in, in those cities and getting you know, using all our capabilities of the platform, whether it's, you know, vernacular capabilities, ads, and contextual placements, and, and so on and so forth, to then optimize for what's called low, lower funnel conversions. Now, we, um, what we have shared here is expressly approved by our uh, advertisers, I mean, to the word and to the team, and, you know, beyond that, I'm not at liberty to say specifically for that particular um, uh, uh, advertise on a particular campaign, but I can perhaps answer for you generally what 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 these lower funnel conversion metrics mean, and they typically mean that a user who has gone well beyond installing the app of the advertiser, well beyond registering into the app to actually subscribing or adding to a shopping cart, or you know showing a very clear purchase intent, you know, uh, with respect to or even in certain cases doing the actual transaction. Okay, mm -hmm. so the deeper funnel is like you start from the top. What is the top of the funnel? Somebody seeing an ad, you know, and as you filter the funnel down, 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 you can go down to a transaction, the first transaction, the key transaction, online to offline transaction. So, so our goal is to consist consistently drive maximize ROI for our customers 
and that means necessarily means that we must optimize for digital funnel conversions. I hope I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Can I squeeze in just one more, sir, please? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, uh, sir. Could you uh, please? Uh, can is it possible for you to give us a split between the converted users for uh, Jamf and our uh, balance of the business, and the same for the rate of uh, conversion? Uh, no, I'm not able to give you that uh, at the moment. But you can. I mean, um, I mean, all of these, I, as I did mention, is that these are comparatively sensitive information. Sure, right? sure. Uh, not it's, a it's, yeah. By people yeah. who are competitors, most of them are not public companies, companies, yeah. even smaller ones, and they're all trying to pick on these calls and details that we share with our investors right. and for, for good measure. And I think so. So, and of course, now we're sharing our case studies as well. I mean, it's almost like. Uh, giving an invitation to a competitor to pick that information and go and make a complete page to get in and say, look, I can. So I, I think we are balancing act and please see that we are very transparent to the extent that we can be. And uh, where we believe we need to necessarily abstract, you know, we, we do that because it's important for uh, retaining the business advantages. Otherwise, we'll end up selling our CPCU per country, per vertical, mm -hmm. per market, and uh, per platform. And I can assure you that will be a, uh, you know, almost an open invitation for competition, you know. So even internally within the company, by the way, I mean, we, we some of this data is... Um, uh, done systematically in the platform so that no no one person can have a full insight into it. Okay, no problem, sir. Thank you so much and best of luck for the future. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pratesh Thakkar from Asian Market Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, congratulations on a good set of numbers and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Just uh, wanted to understand the trend of converted users as in. Uh, Last quarter, we added around 17 million users, uh, and this quarter also we've around added 10 million users uh, on our sequential basis, which is higher than the usual trend what we had uh, previously. So, just wanted to understand is it the shift in the ad dollars from iOS to Android supporting the incremental additions for Apple or some other elements that you want to touch upon? Well, thanks for that question. Yeah, I think the, uh, the best way to look at um, you know, trends when we talk about conversion, I think the historical trends are a great indicator of what's to come in the future. Now, if you look at the last nine months, we have delivered 138.7 million conversions from converted users, and we've done it at approximately 50 rupees INR CPC rate. And if we were to then analyze the trend further over the last four financial years, and just look at Q3 converted users or conversion, you'll find that the CAGR is 67.2%. Now, these are statistics and trends that we have already shared, and these are long-term trends. I mean, I'm talking about either nine months of this financial year or even four years of Q3 analysis and trend. And that's an indication that, look, the consumer adoption clearly across markets, and I think you can relate it to your perhaps own individual experience that all of us, especially during the last few years, have gone way more on our screen time on digital and connected devices. And, 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 and that is true across the board globally. And this is a, not a one-off shift. I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's the new sort of normal now. And, and we expect this kind of adoption to continue to increase for many, many years. As more, uh, uh, you know, younger people start coming on digital devices, as well as people from well beyond tier three cities to rural markets start coming on smart devices. In India alone, I would expect in the next um, few years to have over one billion connected devices. And the number of shoppers in India expected to be close to half a billion shoppers online, like people who are ready to transact you know, online to be at least half a billion over, over the next few years. And this is, this is a massive digital adoption trend. That's a multi-year, uh, multi-fold digital adoption trend that will continue. So this is definitely going to help us uh, to keep the momentum of this kind of a growth. Sure, it was very helpful. Uh, again, on if you can provide any specific vertical out of uh, EFGS that we have that is contributing the most to the overall con conversion uh, or uh, revenue growth this quarter. No, well, thanks for that question. I think the the way we have uh, you know provided the data so far is uh, maybe what I can say um, uh, instead of choosing one which is contributing more or less. Uh, let me tell you that's a very well balanced, uh, uh, broad based growth that Apple is delivering. Uh, unlike, let's say, many years ago, I mean, three to four years ago, we were deeply anchored on 
on e-commerce. I think now it's much more broad based and, and we see each of these verticals becoming, you know, a very, very strong business unit in the company in years to come. Uh, we have deeply anchored ourselves on our 2B strategy, verticalization and vernacular. And both of these 2B strategy help us to basically go deeper, much more deeper in each of the verticals and hyper local with each of the consumers to deliver the deeper funnel conversions and ROI. And I think this is uh, working really well for us. Um, picking any one vertical out and saying this is the highest, I think wouldn't be as insightful as telling you that it is a very broad based growth across verticals, across geographies, and, 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 and there's no real vertical concentration or customer concentration risk at the moment. And we are uh, building our products, uh, people, teams, processes, and, and data science capabilities very verticalized for each of these markets. So, you know, we're getting much sharper in our execution in these verticals. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, again, on the margin front, uh, I have a small question. Um, uh, so you indicated uh, uh, there is some uh, appraisal cycle we had this quarter. So uh, if you can quantify how much is the uh, impact uh, for this quarter from uh, from the way um, Just to give you an answer on this, um, we have about 13.5 uh, million costs coming in uh, in INR, that is 1.35 crores uh, for the ESOP in this quarter, uh, which has contributed in, in a slight increase. Secondly, we have increased our manpower by about 6%. Uh, uh, rest is on the uh, increase in the salaries of the uh, the employee cost. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Arun. That's it from my side. Thank you. Next question is from the line of Samir Choksi from Endos Equity Advisors. Please go ahead. Thank you. I hope I'm audible. Yes. Thank you. Yes, you yeah, I am. Okay, thank you. Uh, my commendations on a fantastic set of numbers to Mr. Khanna Swam and the entire team. So I have a couple of questions. Now, firstly, we're seeing this whole metaverse theme playing out and the whole world going gung-ho over it. But let's say we look at the potential use cases with brands like, you know, H&M. They have been going out and setting up digital storefronts. Uh, virtual customers come and interact with them and their products. Now, how would Asil fit in here? Would the customer interactions be able to be virtually measured? I'm, you know, aware of the fact that this is a hypothetical question, given we're so early in the theme. But if you could just share your insight on that. Well, first of all, thank you for your kind words on our performance. I much appreciate it. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, it's a good question because it's a forward-looking question. It is a question that is deeply valid, given the fact that Apple is anchored on or culture of delivering forward looking locations consistently. And, and so, so this is uh, If you look at one of the uh, recent patients that uh, we got granted in the US patent office, it talks about, you know, lectures. How, you know, to, at this moment, you know, the human interaction with the machine is, especially mobile devices, is either voice based or it is touch based, where we are typing some input or by clicking or by something in the This is the question of the meeting with technology. Now, if we go into the world of metaverse, I'm sorry to interrupt to you, to uh, Mr. but Mr. Anand, your voice is breaking, sir. We cannot hear you clearly. Okay, I am both of you. Uh, sorry, sir, but we cannot hear you. Your voice is uh, not uh, it's cracking up. Uh, let me call Mr. Anush again. Please give me a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay connected until we connect Mr. Anush. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for patiently holding your line. The line of Mr. Anuj is connected back. Thank you and over to you, sir. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I hope you can all hear me much better now. And, uh, you know, what I was talking about was how the recent uh, patent that Apple got is actually preparing ourselves for a scenario where the human interaction with the machine or technology would be much more subtle. It will not be a voice command or it will not be a type in and tap something, but it could be as simple as a very subtle gesture. And, and the gesture could be to your uh, to your avatar or to your you know or or to your you know digital persona uh, in and 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 therefore uh, it could lead to your digital persona behaving in a certain manner just based on very subtle gestures or your technology assistant they could be robots they could be other sort of intelligent devices or connected devices but there will be new consumer interaction experiences. And in order to make sure that our product roadmap, our IP portfolio is ready for the future, Apple has already invested in not only filing for these patents, but actually achieving success in getting those patents granted in the, let's say, most important U.S. patent office. Um, and I think this shows that uh, Apple, the company that hopefully a lot of you are, uh, or your funds are invested in, is prepared and thinking ahead and is demonstrating that in its actions with tangible kind of um, outcomes being secured. Now, to your specific question about what brands like H&M uh, are doing, I think what is absolutely wonderful about the world ahead is that digital first companies are going more into the physical world and starting to create offline store brands. And of course, those offline offline storefronts also are very, very digitally, uh, you know, uh, advanced. Uh, and in Singapore, we have seen that already. I mean, we've seen offline storefronts that are completely unmanned and, you know, it's served by robots. I mean, we've also seen some hotels in Singapore where, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a robot that does room service. I mean, so, so there are things which are already happening in the world where offline industries are becoming more digital and they're going into the, including the world of metaverse. And then we also see digital companies uh, going more and more offline. So, so what I'm trying to tell you is that don't be uh, looking at it from one angle. See the entire consumer journey as an integrated journey in the physical, virtual, and augmented physical and virtual worlds, which all become one integrated journey. And so H&M would have to then look at how is the digital store connecting with the way the behavior is on a physical store, mapping off the actual human behavior to the human avatar behavior, authentic authentic avatar versus a fraud avatar of the human. So there'll be all kinds of interesting technologies. And I think for us, uh, being a, uh, even our fraud tools, which we you know, have several patents on, the fundamental essence of that is the ability to know which interaction is a human interaction and which interaction is a machine interaction. Today, if a machine is doing something on behalf of the human, one must check, is that authentic? Or is that a fraud? And, and and that ability that our company already has with the patents granted, plus the ability to look at you know gestures based communications as well as other subtle forms of communication, I you know I think to that extent I can tell you we are visualized. And 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 as the world unfolds and the consumer adoption and behaviors change, I think we will have some big advantages in emerging markets because chances are that some of these things will get adopted in the Japan, Korea, Singapore, U.S or China faster than it gets adopted in India, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Africa, and Latin. And so we will have some advantage of uh, foresight and then better preparation to uh, localize, vernacularize our innovation. Uh, while you know, we don't want to be second to any, and we are well prepared and, and keep ahead. So thanks for that question. This is the best that I could do to answer it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a great perspective. I'm cognizant of the time, so I'll just ask my uh, last two questions together. So, you know, we've been over this question of privacy many times before, and I understand Apple is not affected by the changes in, you know, the browser privacy norms by Google. Uh, you've highlighted this during previous calls. But let's say, you know, in the future, Google uh, alters on-device privacy norms via operating system updates. Would this also affect hybrid Android systems? You know, these are utilized by OEMs. Or would the OEMs retain, say, uh, the control over the privacy and user data norms, given they utilize uh, these hybrid systems, which are not purely Android systems? And secondly, uh, if it's possible, 
could you break down your connected device numbers in terms of mobile and non mobile devices um like say in a percentage term or is it too uh, nascent you know to uh, provide this number as the entire uh, spectrum is mostly covered by mobile connected devices uh, if there's any revenue contribution from these as well uh, that's all from my side thank you well thanks for the question so yes i will first of all reconfirm apple is deeply insulated with anything that's happening on the browser or cookies and uh, for whatever is worth i think uh, for 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 the entire tech industry cookies is like a technology more than 20 years ago with http and browser and the internet and we are we are looking forward you know we are looking forward to new technologies and better more efficient internet uh, and and i think better things will come around so absolutely no love for Uh, the cookie is going away, and I think Apple's business is, has no impact at all. In terms of what has already happened on iOS, the fact that you know the whole industry was super nervous about it, and some of the companies are obviously still impacted, and we've seen that from some some of the bigger players announcing that they are deeply impacted by iOS changes. And then for us, Apple was deeply anchored on you know emerging markets, which are predominantly Android, and so we had very little exposure to uh, to iOS, but we. So a great opportunity. We saw like when the field is changing for the incumbents in a way that is making them nervous. Maybe be a new entrant with an innovative uh, platform capability and 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 create a new position for ourselves. Uh, and and we did that really well with Jam. I think the Jam acquisition was timed perfectly for us because we wanted to be first hand going into the U.S. market, experiencing how to turn this challenge into an opportunity. and we did that very well in at least for the last nine uh, nine months i think we've done really well on the idfa part so that gives me confidence to say that when as and when google does something which by the way is at least a few years away because of you know your own question the complexities of hybrid oems uh, hybrid uh, models and you know who will retain control i mean you know making changes on the google or ecosystem is way more complex versus google making any change on its browser or apple making any change on its ios platform and and because of those companies that came in years uh, away we we are no longer even nervous about what changes happen on ios let alone having you know nervousness about what might happen on google so i think i just want you to know that being a hands on entrepreneur in this space and a significant owner within the apple group i am not nervous about this particular thing at the same time we're not ignoring it or taking it lightly it's not like oh we have solved everything there will be changes there will be challenges but i think that the confidence with which we are solving for challenges has just gone up because of the way we have negotiated and transformed the challenge into an opportunity on idfa so one step at a time let's see let's not um, uh, uh, get overly burdened by what might happen on google and i and i show you this many years away and we have many more problems calls in between that to to address it progressively thank you um you know that last question uh, on the connected device uh, mix if you could just uh, allude to that yeah yeah so so on connected devices uh, you know we 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 look at uh, our, our perspective is very simple we are consumer centric consumer platform wherever the consumer goes whether it is mobile or it is wearable devices or it's connected tv or the consumer goes offline we will follow and go to all of those places with the consumer whether it is the metaverse or whether it is the physical real world i think the the uh, so our focus is consumer centric now within that how important is it now to they segment our revenue by what's on mobile versus what's on other connected device i think at the moment uh, it is very very nascent to go into such uh, uh, granularity but what's important for you to know is that our strategy is clearly consumer centric and that is a big differentiation because there are many companies whose strategy is very focused on one part of the consumer journey you know they only deal with consumer when he is on facebook or when he is on google when he is on offline or when he is on tv and i'm you know we saying hey hold on a second we need to look at the consumer holistically and that's the only way i believe the business can be done well for the long term understood thank you so much and my best wishes for the future good luck thank you thank you
The next question is from the line of Manish Poda from Nepal, India. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, Anush. Uh, thanks for doing the call and you know, congrats on the results. So just, you know, probably two questions. One is, uh, would you be able to help me with, you know, jam revenues in the base quarter? Because I think you mentioned one third of the revenues this quarter uh, is coming from jam. So just w what is the, let's say, if I have to just understand the growth, how, how is that number, let's say, in the base quarter? Uh, what do you mean by uh, growth? You're talking about jam specific growth. Yes. Um, oops, I, I, I think I, I don't have that specific number. But I, what I can tell you is what I prepared for is to tell you that our organic growth has been, you know, quite fantastic on a year on a year, -on -year basis. And you know, I think we're seeing uh, from a bottom line perspective, you know, well over 50 percent of our growth uh, in terms of EBITDA organically uh, is, uh, uh, is is coming uh, from the organic business and 86% of the EBITDA is actually coming from the organic business. Now, uh, Kapil, if you have any specific numbers on jam, but I, I mean, I don't think uh, I have that data immediately on my hand, but you know, I can tell you qualitatively, I'm super satisfied with the kind of growth momentum uh, that we have jointly unlocked on the uh, on the jam business uh, through upselling and cross-selling the various use case scenarios. So uh, then, yeah, yes, please. Sorry, sorry, Kabir. So the uh, jam has uh, approximately grown by about thirty percent plus uh, in this quarter to the previous quarter. Uh, if you see that uh, we had made a commentary that uh, last time it was it was uh, just above uh, thirty percent of our turnover. And this time it's just about uh, one third of the turnover. So you can make it out and it's uh, contributed about uh, you know, in the range of 30% plus uh, growth in the jam business. Okay, uh, Anuj, uh, just any sense then, let's say, how is the market growing up there and let's say any, some, any sense on the market share uh, for jam in, in the market which it caters to? Uh, you see, our, our, like I said before, I mean, we, we operate as one connected consumer platform. Our goal is to uh, integrate, you know, and already are doing well integration of Jamf as part of our platform overall. And uh, when we uh, when we look at the growth in Latin American markets, clearly the growth is of the standard of emerging markets. But when we look at developed markets also, including for what Jamf is doing, I mean, I think the A for the market size is huge. You know, we are uh, having a massive runway for, for growth. And in terms of our execution focus, we focus on key emerging verticals in those markets, which are high growth verticals even in those markets. So, um, I mean, I don't have any specific data point on what is our revenue as a percentage of market share or the total market share at the moment. But, you know, I think it's, uh, I can simply tell you one thing that, Every single business unit in our company and every single entrepreneur leader in our company is at least gunning for 25 to 30% growth on CLDR terms. And the reason for that is because the industry average growth rate is, uh, you know, is at least in that round. Uh, and and so, so it is part of the DNA of Apple that anybody is doing any, any, uh, any part of the business in Apple is clearly gunning for a growth above industry average growth. And, and for us, that means 25 to 30 percent. We are not giving any leeway to one market or the other. Uh, second, it has to be a deeply profitable growth, and everybody has to aim for that, you know, high teams of profitability. So, so there is a consistent focus on these two elements, and therefore we talk about sustainable, profitable growth as a part of our culture. You know, it's not just about one quarter or one business unit. Everyone has to be aligned like that, and, and so the entire organization you know, uh, is geared towards that outcome. And I think that should give you an assurance. If you're looking at modeling jam separately from us and trying to find a growth rate pattern for that or for any part of our business units, kindly look at it holistically as one platform which is going to deliver that kind of growth. And uh, there could be one quarter where one platform does better than the other or another one. But, I mean, those, those things would average out over time. Okay, just uh, one last one. So, uh, in terms of other income, let's say this 14 and a half crore on it, is there any one-off on this, or this is largely the cash yield on the uh, the yield on the cash which is on the books? Uh, uh, the cash yield is uh, 
you see for quarter three is largely on the uh, the cash on the, the yield on the cash. Uh, but uh, if you see from quarter two, quarter two had uh, the uh, the fair value adjustments for our investments. So you yeah. have to eliminate both, and it has been given in our presentation uh, the elimination we do. If you can refer to the presentation for greater details. So so roughly about let's say fifty fifty five crore is the run rate for this year. Let's say the mark to market was I think you know five to seven crores. Uh, in the last quarter can, can, can you repeat the question i'm just more. saying so let's say roughly 50 crores of other income on the books and let's say if you are running four 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 and a half percent yield that would give you the cash on books you can think that way but uh, yeah but uh, but uh, the yield is about uh, around three three and a half percent on the three 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 and a half okay fair enough thank you so much thank you mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen this was the last question for today I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Anuj Kanna Soham for closing comments. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for uh, staying tuned into the call today, and I sincerely uh, appreciate the support that the investors have continuously shown and the belief that the investors have shown in the company. Uh,